Good morning, everyone. My name is David Frazier, and I serve as Associate Dean for the MBA programs. I want to welcome you here this morning. On behalf of our faculty and staff of the Henry B. Tippey College of Business, I welcome our soon-to-be graduates, families, friends, and significant others to our spring 2016 commencement. This event celebrates the great achievements of graduates from all of our Iowa MBA programs. These programs include the full-time MBA program, the professional MBA program, with locations in Cedar Rapids, Des Moines, and the Quad Cities, the executive MBA program, with locations in Iowa City and Des Moines, the Hong Kong MBA program, and the Chimba Italy MBA program. The diversity of our programs is a strength that allows us to reach and touch many stakeholders, particularly in this period of persistent global change. In this regard, we offer one MBA program, the University of Iowa Masters of Business Administration, in all of these locations. As you can see from the flags displayed here today, which represent the countries of origin of our new graduates, the Iowa MBA is truly an international program. And it is great to have family and friends here from around the world, along with our faculty and staff, to acknowledge the accomplishments of this year's graduates. The Iowa MBA is a family of programs united by a common vision and value proposition dedicated to producing managers and leaders with the ability to complete, compete in the global marketplace. Our graduates have developed functional expertise, built teamwork and leadership skills, and solidified ethical foundations that will enable them to enrich the organizations that they serve, the global business community, and society at large. At this point, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce my colleagues on the platform, and I'll ask them to please stand as I read their names. Sarah Fisher Guardio, Dean, Henry B. Tippey College of Business. Frederick Crawford, Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer of AFLAC Incorporated, our keynote speaker for today. Barry Butler, Executive Vice President and Provost, the University of Iowa. Kurt Onstriker, Senior Associate Dean, Henry B. Tippey College of Business. Jennifer Blackhurst, Professor and Faculty Director of the MBA Business Analytics Career Academy. Luciano De Castro, Associate Professor, Economics. Thomas Gruca, Professor and Faculty Director of the MBA Marketing Career Academy. Andrew Hosmanic, Lecturer, Management and Organizations. Mark Penno, Professor, Accounting. Thomas Reitz, Professor and Faculty Director of the MBA Finance Career Academy. And now the staff representatives from the MBA programs. David Dyack, Assistant Dean of the Full-Time MBA program. Colleen Downey, Assistant Dean of the Professional MBA program. Don Kluber, Assistant Dean of the Executive MBA program. Jan Fassi, Business Director of the MBA Marketing Career Academy. Charles Fishkin, Business Director of the MBA Finance Academy. Jill Com Tompkins, Director of Student Services for the full-time MBA program. Nicole Vogt, Director of the Cedar Rapids Professional MBA program. Michelle Pontarelli, Director of the Quad Cities Professional MBA program. And Michael Williams, Director of the Des Moines Professional MBA program. I would like to now ask the Dean of the Henry B. Tippey College of Business to say a few words of welcome and then introduce our keynote commencement speaker, Dean Sarah Guardio. Welcome to all of you. It is a beautiful day and it is a joyous day. I, am, I have to say, I'm a sucker for these events. These are celebratory milestones in the lives of, of not just our graduates, but their families. And it is truly one of those days where we, we come together 
and are able to really celebrate as a community the wonderful work that we are doing and will continue to do. I, I have to say that as the graduates are looking ahead at what happens next, because this chapter is behind them, for the, the faculty and the administrators of the College of Business, there's a little bit of looking behind for us. Because what we're always asking ourselves is, did we do the right thing by you? Did we give you everything that you needed while you were with us to go out and, and be successful, however you define that, and fulfill your dreams for life beyond this program? Um, I admit that you know, that's a, a really heavy burden, heavy responsibility, actually, that we carry. And so I was recently interested in an article that came out uh, where the London Business School had done a survey of over 100 business executives around the school, uh, around the world. And they had asked them, what is required for success in a global business environment? And I thought, ah, this is something I need to pay attention to and, you know, make sure that, that we're responding and, and covering uh, these, these topics. And so the things that they came up with, the, the skills that they imagined that are necessary for success fell into three buckets. I want to talk about those three buckets really briefly. So the, the first bucket is what I would call tools, skills. And they said, absolutely, you know, managers, leaders need global finance and strategy and decision-making skills and, and marketing and technology and, and data and, and all those kinds of things. And they also need to have the skills to, to deal with ambiguity and uncertainty and, and to, to work in teams and to network and, and collaborate. And I'm pretty confident that we covered those bases. And, you know, as I look at the curriculum and, and I know what you've done in and out of class, those are two areas where, you know, I'm pretty darn sure that we've given you not only coverage, but really some cutting edge and, and thoughtful uh, ability to address those topics. So it was the third category that really struck my interest because this is where things got a little fuzzy for us and they said they, they call this category attributes I'm not sure that's a good word for it but these were the things they said were in this third bucket unyielding integrity worldly awareness the ability to thrive on change judgment and intuition demanding excellence perseverance and tenacity adaptability and responsiveness, passion and persuasion, curiosity and creativity, self-awareness, self-confidence to involve others, boundless energy, and the capacity and the desire to continue to learn. Now you can see that when you get off into that area, things start getting a little fuzzier, and, and I guarantee you we don't have courses that have those titles. Right? We don't have the perseverance and tenacity course or department. So in contemplating these things, I understand that those are core characteristics that don't just come from your time in an educational institution, your parents, your family, your former teachers, your colleagues. There are so many pieces of the world that contribute to you building those things as you grow up. But hopefully we've, we've done the right thing to reinforce all of those attributes when you've been here in the program with us because I guarantee you that the tools and the skills are, th th that'll punch your ticket, that'll get you in the door. But the thing that will make you successful over time are really those things in that, that third bucket. And those are the things that you continue to develop even long after you're here. So, you know, my challenge to you is to continue to develop that piece of who you are. And if you ask me how to do that, I would quote one of my favorite authors, Alice Walker, who said, we must be careful what we feed our souls. And we feed our souls through all kinds of things, television, books, the people that we hang out with, 
Um, there are just a whole lot of, of opportunities there. And I will tell you that I really believe you are what you eat. So if you feed yourself a diet of cynicism and rigidity and arrogance and intolerance and greed and self-interest, and we see that all around us in the world today, you will surely become what you eat. On the other hand, if you make sure that you choose a diet from your world that is full of optimism and flexibility, compassion, tolerance, a spirit of giving and sensitivity to the needs of others and even the willingness to serve them, you will become something quite different over time. And so in this regard, I think those executives were correct. I think that you know, what falls in that third bucket are the kinds of things where we need to set our sights and, and keep our focus for years to come because we never, ever finish developing those parts of ourselves. And I will tell you this, I also believe that while they might also lead to career success, they will also lead you to a happy life. They will define the legacy that you leave behind yourself. And so to you, my last words are bon appetit. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker. One of the joys of my job is to travel around Iowa, around the world, around the country, and meet alumni of our various programs. And I can tell you that Iowans are doing amazing things, extraordinarily successful things at the top of some of the best countries in this planet. And our speaker today is certainly a great example of that. Frederick Crawford is the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of AFLAC Incorporated. He recently made his move from the Midwest, from Indianapolis to Columbus, Georgia. And being a Southern girl, we spent a little time at dinner last night with me coaching he and his wife into, you know, how to settle into his Southern side that needs to come out now. Fred joined AFLEC in June of 2015. He is responsible for overseeing the financial management of company operations. But behind that, he brings nearly three decades of financial leadership and experience. Most recently with the CNO Financial Group, where he was the Vice President and Chief Financial Officer since 2012. Prior to that, the Lincoln Financial Group, where he served in progressive roles including Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer, and before that with the Bank One Corporation. He received his bachelor's degree from Indiana State University, but his master's of business degree, master's of business administration was here at the University of Iowa, and so was his wife Priscilla, who is, is with us. They actually were here in class together. He has uh, served as an advisory board member of the finance department, and will be a forthcoming member of the advisory board for the College of Business. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Fred Crawford. Uh, good morning, good morning. Uh, Dean Gargill, uh, members of the faculty, students, distinguished guests, and fellow alumni, it's, uh, it's truly an honor to be here today. Uh, I graduated from uh, the Iowa MBA program, as Sarah mentioned, in 1987 and spent two of the most impactful years of my life here on campus. Uh, while working on my master's uh, here, I was active on campus. I was teaching undergraduate marketing uh, as a young teaching assistant. As a former college track athlete, I was a graduate assistant with the track and cross country team here at Iowa. Uh, in fact, during my first year here, I shared a house with a 17-foot pole vaulter, a 26-foot long jumper, a couple of distance runners, along with the occasional 300-pound Big Ten shot put champ, and of course, offensive lineman, uh, and a 7-foot high jumper. So let me just say that in the second year of my MBA career here, I had to scramble a bit to get my grades up. 
uh, to say the least. Most importantly, I met my wife, Priscilla, here on campus. We met while teaching undergraduate marketing. Priscilla is also a graduate with her MBA in 1987 and is here with me today. Uh, we're proud Hawkeyes, uh, Iowa football season ticket holders. Uh, so as you can see, between earning a master's degree and meeting the woman of my dreams, my time here was both well-rounded and, and well-spent. Before I get started, at AFLAC, we never, ever miss an opportunity to drive home our brand. Uh, so for those of you who joined us for brunch this morning, uh, we've arranged a small gift, this, this little guy, uh, and uh, as a, a graduate AFLAC duck in its little graduate uh, uniform. Uh, and yes, of course, if you squeeze it, AFLAC, AFLAC, AFLAC. Yeah, um, everybody loves the duck. I'll talk to you more about this, uh, this guy a little later uh, in my remarks. I remember like it was yesterday sitting in the audience like you and getting ready to launch my career. I know from sitting where you are today that the most important thing I can tell you is that my remarks today will be brief. Uh, we all have experiences that forever change and impact our lives. Uh, I thought it focused my comments on a few lessons learned from an event that really changed me uh, forever uh, as a business person and as a chief financial officer, and that event was the 2009 financial crisis. A lot's been written about it. Uh, I was CFO of a Fortune 500 company, uh, financial service company at the time, Lincoln Financial Group. Uh, during the financial crisis, Lincoln was, at the time, a 105-year-old life insurance company that gained the rights to its name from Abe Lincoln's son. Today, Lincoln remains a well-respected company with strong leadership and a strong market position. Typical of a large life insurance company, entering into the crisis, Lincoln had an $80, $80 billion in asset balance sheet and another uh, invested in the bond market and another $60 billion invested uh, in the stock market. We were sophisticated, had strong risk management and hedged away much of the risk associated with market volatility. But as some of you will recall, this was a crisis very, very few people predicted. Uh, only a few obscure, obscure Wall Street uh, players now profiled in last year's movie, The Big Short. With so-called A-rated securities all of a sudden heading towards default and the S&P 500 index dropping from the 1600 range to below 600, Lincoln stock, once traded at $70 a share, had plummeted to $5 a share at its low point in the crisis. A once prominent analyst even wrote a headline on our company that I'll never forget. It was called Lincoln throwing in the towel. Lincoln was not alone. In fact, virtually every company in our industry and our peer group was struggling in a similar way. One CEO of a company I later worked for when watching his stock plummet during the crisis commented, I'm exhausted. I've been a CEO of a large cap, mid cap, and small cap company all in one week. As a CFO, your days were long and stressful, not only with what you would expect, concerned investors, Wall Street analysts, rating agencies, audit firms, and the media, but more important to me were employees worried about their 401ks, pensions, and of course their jobs. CEOs and CFOs had to walk an impossible line of showing confidence and strength, but being candid and transparent with the risks and the challenges. I had a whiteboard in my office and spent late nights and weekends with our CEO and other team members discussing not plan B. Plan B was long gone. As an industry, most of us were on plan C and plan D by that point. With the help of a strong team and battle-tested CEO, we managed through, as did others, and recovered. Today, the company is strong and grew stronger from the experience. As a person and a company, you never know how strong you are until you're tested. I had a former colleague approach me currently, uh, recently, actually, at a retirement party for my chief accounting officer while I was at Lincoln. He said, I remember you during the crisis. You really kept strong and gave us confidence. You led the company out of the crisis, and I'll never forget it. I thanked him for the kind words and then reminded him that I was also the same CFO that was in charge of the finances when we found ourselves in challenging conditions. 
So today I want to share with you some lessons learned, not just from the perspective of what worked and I'm proud of, but also wanting some do-overs, quite honestly. Uh, I'm going to leverage off a few memorable quotes from a former and current CEOs and board members I worked with that guided me and still guide me today. As a member of my team once said, let's not let a good crisis go to waste. Lesson one, you can run fast alone, but you can run farther together. As a former cross-country runner and track coach, I particularly like this statement. And no surprise, it comes from an old African proverb, the birthplace of some of the greatest distance runners in the world. I don't tend to think of myself as chief financial officer. I'm an experienced executive who occupies the office of the CFO. In order to properly make decisions and manage the finances of a $29 billion market cap Fortune 120 company like Aflac, you share your office with many trusted advisors, advisors, gathering different viewpoints are critical in making decisions and it's impossible for leaders to have all the answers. During the financial crisis, that approach was essential. Any one of us could run fast, but in order to see the entire landscape of issues and narrow it down to a simple set of decisions, it took a team devoted to coordination and collaboration. I did not lead Lincoln out of the crisis. A team did, and it reshaped how risk management is conducted at companies. The lesson learned by the industry, risk management is not a centralized function. It's an innate element owned by many individuals on the front line of decision making and baked into the culture and fabric of the work they do every day. Lesson two, every day I wake up and I say a prayer that I'll see things for what they are, not for what I hope them to be. That was a quote from an accomplished board member I worked with during the crisis. Hope is unfortunately not a strategy. Be realistic, see things for what they are, build a plan and execute. The action of doing yields hope in of itself, which is unbelievable in calming anxiety and stress in people and teams. As a leader, you have to balance optimism and confidence with realism and cold practicality and do what it takes to face issues head on. Remember that unlike wine, bad news does not improve with age. Be proactive in identifying bad news. If your boss ever criticizes you for uncovering bad news, find a new boss or employer fast. Many companies tend to wait out a crisis. Those who are wise know that if you see something out of the ordinary, you need to address it, analyze it, and if warranted, go public with it. Facing the reality up front is always to your advantage. Related to this concept is recognizing reality for what it is, a brief comment on models and modeling. I know you all love models and modeling. Before the crisis, risk managers worked for models, many of which were ultimately proven to be inadequate many of which were really not seeing the reality of the situation. The fatal flaw was an inability to model a scenario. Go figure, it turns out real world experiences are difficult to model. Remember, the one common trait of a so-called black swan event is nobody sees it coming. The lesson, as a manager, it's important to introduce experience and judgment into any modeling exercise. The fact is, many CFOs like myself had turned conservative prior to the crisis, simply because the market seemed overheated, but failed to trust our instincts when looking at models that said all was well. So see things for what they are, not what you hope them to be, and trust your experienced gut. Lesson three. Don't risk a lot for a little, and don't risk more than you can afford to lose. I'm willing to bet that some of you have never heard of Aflac prior to 2000 when the Aflac duck came on the scene. Today, more than 9 out of 10 people know the Aflac brand. In 1998, Aflac would be hard-pressed to ever achieve meaningful brand recognition without some kind of bold advertising campaign that would make fun of our name using this little guy. A boisterous duck, it would take some guts. Don't risk a little, don't risk a lot for a little. Well, the first commercial of our new campaign would cost us one million dollars. But if the commercial worked, it would mean millions in return. Don't risk more than you can afford to lose. If the commercial was not a success, we planned on pulling it immediately to cut our losses. And although we would not like it, we could afford to lose a million dollars. 
Despite the successful testing of a traditional feel-good commercial with Ray Romano, remember Ray Romano? Of Everyone Loves Raymond fame, and a group of kids, that commercial tested 50% better than any commercial we had ever made up to that point. But our research told us that a loudmouth duck commercial tested significantly, and I mean significantly better. Our CEO asked a CEO friend of his, and his comment was, nobody ever got fired over a 50% increase, go with Ray Romano. But when push came to shove, our CEO used his gut instincts and made a bold but calculated decision to use the Aflac duck. Imagine going to your board, to investors, heck, to your family members, well, there's this duck, and he quacks Aflac. To this day, our CEO says, I bet my entire career on a damn duck. <laughs> well, the Aflac duck commercials have become one of the most successful advertising campaigns ever, putting our company in the company of Apple, Nike, and Coca-Cola from a brand perspective. What most people don't realize is the Aflac duck is just as well known and successful in Japan as it is in the U.S. In the 1970s, John Amos, who founded Aflac with his brothers, Paul and Bill, were traveling to Osaka, Japan to visit the World's Fair. While there, he noticed Japanese people wearing surgical masks, common during cold and flu season in Japan. At that moment, it occurred to him how ideal their health insurance products would be for a risk-adverse culture and the sale of their products. Four years later, Aflac received a license to sell insurance in Japan, becoming the second American insurance company in 29 years at that time to receive permission to do business in Japan. Following more than four decades of success, Aflac Japan wrote more than $1 billion in new sales last year. Today, we insure one in four Japanese households, and our name recognition is even stronger in Japan than it is in the U.S. All of those results stem from the 1970 World Fair in Osaka, Japan, a gut instinct, surgical masks, and a calculated risk. We could have considered acquiring our way into Japan, but that would mean risking more than we can afford. So we built from the ground up in measured way. By the way, remember that $1 million commercial, don't risk a lot for a little? Well, today we spend roughly $125 million a year worldwide on this guy. And more importantly, our brand has been independently valued at over $9 billion. Finally, and in closing, a comment on giving back. Today, somehow, corporate America and some executives seem to have a bad name, particularly, it seems, in an election year. There are, in fact, excesses and some bad actors, and I'm not here to defend corporate America or ex executive pay packages, uh, but I don't know of any executive or reputable company, for that matter, that does not give significantly to the community. Following the devastating earthquake and, and tsunami in Japan in 2011, Aflac was the first company to donate to the victims of the devastation through the Red Cross. More importantly, though, the U.S. State Department issued a voluntary evacuation and warning for travel to Japan, if you remember. Warnings and evacuation aside, two days later, our CEO was on his way to Japan. Remember, we were sending our CEO into a potential nuclear disaster at that time. And most global companies were busy moving teams and particularly executives out of Japan. Our Japanese employees were touched by the message of support and hope he delivered on behalf of people across the United States. Going over there was the right thing to do and showed true leadership by our CEO. It emphasized how much we care about the Japanese people. You may wonder about the latest series of earthquakes in Japan uh, but again, we're early to contribute 30 million yen to the relief efforts. We also provide significant support to Aflac Parents House in Japan, which includes three locations that are essentially akin to Ronald McDonald houses here in the U.S. At the Aflac Parents House, children who are battling cancer and other serious diseases can stay with their families in a home away from home environment while they are treated. Here in the U.S., our national philanthropic focus is the, at Aflac is pediatric cancer treatment and research. In 1995, we were the first, we first began the Aflac Cancer and Blood Disorder Center 
uh, in Atlanta. Uh, the fight against childhood cancer is something that has been very personal to everyone at AFLAC. We started in 1995 as a donation sparked by the cause that transformed AFLAC's culture. The AFLAC Cancer Center has been named one of the top pediatric cancer centers in the country by U.S. and World Report. To date, the entire AFLAC family combined has given more than $100 million to the AFLAC Cancer and Blood Disorder Center. To bring it full circle, the plush AFLAC ducks I mentioned that you'll be receiving as a gift at brunch are a symbol of our commitment to fighting childhood cancer as the proceeds from each one of these uh, are donated uh, to go to the fight against cancer. So each time you quack them, uh, please know uh, they are part of an army of AFLAC ducks dedicated to the treatment of research and battle against cancer. The book Good to Great, a book that profiled good companies as compared to some of the world's great companies, offered a variety of simple tests that illustrate the difference, but one of them was a simple one. Is your company, if your company ceased to exist, would anyone care? The world is waiting and hungering not only for your work, for the work you're doing, but for the good you are yet to do. As you move forward with your careers and lives, I hope you will carry with you the shared values of the University of Iowa on your journey. Make a difference in the work you do, build careers and lead companies that make a difference. I never would have imagined that my life would be influenced by two important birds, a hawk and a duck. <laughs> I hope some of these lessons on managing risk and giving back will make a difference in your life and I wish you all the best of luck. You are armed with one of the most valuable degrees in the business world. You're off to a great start. Thank you very much and go Hawks. Thank you, Fred. It is now time for the conferral of the degrees. Provost Butler, will you join me at the podium at this time? And will the candidates for the degree Master of Business Administration please rise? Provost Butler. These candidates, having completed all the requirements for the degree Master of Business Administration, are recommended to you by the faculty of the Henry B. Tippey College of Business for the conferral of the degree. Dean Gardiel, on recommendation of the faculty of the Henry B. Tippey College of Business and by the authority vested in me by the Board of Regents, State of Iowa, I confer on each of you the degree Master of Business Administration as qualified and designated. Congratulations. <laughs> will the graduates please be seated? The graduates will be introduced by Michael Williams. As our graduates are introduced today, you will notice that some are wearing gold cords on their robes. These cords identify those graduates whose high level of academic achievement in the MBA program has earned the designation of graduating with distinction. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the Tippy College of Business MBA class of 2016. Families, friends, your applause, your cheers, hoots, hollers are strongly encouraged. This is a time for celebration. Jacob Abuel. Guillermo Aguilar. Christopher Anderson. Jessica Anderson. Thomas Anderson. Amanda Archer.
Krishna Kumar Bhakti Saran. Thomas Baldwin. Brian Victor Becker. Sue Beckwith. Sarah Bendapudi. Joe Benish. Lee Bennett. Kim Berg Olson. Bavesha Bandari. Laura Bonnefeld. Mark Brewer. Stephen Brewer. Sophia Castillo. Meadle Chowdhury. Satya Chintamanani. Emily Choate. Kim Coletti. Shanine Comstock. Corey Connor. Aaron Crawford. Jonathan Dahlman. Brendan Daly. Alec Davis. Bernardo Daza. Andre de Souza. Pavni Duela. Moses Arul. Kapil Dingra. Nirosh Tatal. Casey Dre. Dietrich Drainco. Nathan Drew. Mike Duff. Gwendolyn Deerland. Jason Eyshide. Mustafa Aldada. Sam Iliopoulos. Daniel Emerson. Luke Fenner. Lisa Ferguson. Richard Flies. Ian Flynn. Anthony Fonzone.
Marita Frazee. Eric Friend. Zachary Garthoff. Katie Giroux. George Garib. Molly Gill. Russell Glass. Ann Goff. Brady Grease. Buwan Gupta. John Hall. Joseph Haluska. Aaron Hannon. Robert Heen. Ryan Hegstrom. Maria Helfenberger. Stuart Hemesaf. Jessica Hendricks. Nigel Hibbert. Brad Hitchler. Herman Wumpanu. Adnan Iqbal. Jeremy James. Vishal Joshi. Amit Karmshil. Janelle Karsten. Michael P. Kelleher. Corey Kelly. Jonathan Kerr. Jessica Kinney. Jeremy Klein. Kristen Knudsen. Matthew Kroll. Ashish Kumar. Santosh Lad. Lane Larson. Jessica Ledger Kalen. Michael Lee. Jacob Leib. Jamie Lejeune. Nicholas Lenters. Kate Leonard Getty. Janelle Lewis. Hubencio Linares. Lien Leo. Aaron Loomis. Tian Shanji Ma.
Afshin Maliki. Zachary N. Markoff. Shane Marler. Terry McAllister. Pranav Mehta. Kevin Meller. Daniel Miller. Julianne Moran. Nicole Moritz. Paul Morrison. Kyle Allen Moulton. Brian Nagel. Narin Nanduri. Catherine Nash. Adam Neverman. Derek Nolan. Samantha Norris. Sheila Oliver. Sanjeev Kumar Paul. Joe Parsons. Kalpesh Patel. Scott Patton. Ariane Patterson. Olaf Peterson. Bruno Polaseni. Adam Pretorius. Andrew Prusha. Joshua Putz. Diksha Rai. Hari Ramakrishnan. Ashwin Ramesh. Timothy Rebick. Christy Rohr. Michael Ruggles. Rick Schaefer. Elizabeth Schneider. Stephanie Schnicker. Vincent Jones. Brad Seaton. The Pak Sarawat. Ingrid Sensor. Amit Shah. Sahar Shah. Anun Shreeder. Ashley Simpson. Stephen Summers. Matthew Stephan. Carrie Stillman.
Kimberly Swanson. Beth Takimoto. Leanna Tomaclo. Richard Tanney. Sarah Thompson. Maureen Tierney. Carrie Todd. Brock Toll. Stacy Vandersnick. Money, way the way the I am. Avni Vora. Teresa Wallig. Kathy Yui Wong. Carolyn Weaver. Kyle Weir. David Weltman. Jennifer Wilkening. William Wood. Joseph Woodward. Paul Worrell. Ping Wu. Eric Yude. Jun Chang. Ariadna Arias Rosario. Honbo Jia. Matt Ryder. Dan B. Ryder. Christina Irby. Adam Jalitzer. Nandan Manjunata. Whitney Brooks. We'll give the last of our graduates a couple of minutes to get back to their seats. In case the audience is wondering what's happening back there, they're getting another photo taken. So, um, I'd like to just take a couple of minutes to acknowledge the MBA staff who have contributed to the growth and development and education of all of our great graduates today and also have been serving as assistants to make this ceremony actually work. So there's, there's quite an effort there, and uh, particularly I'd like to thank uh, my administrative assistant, Tara, who had main responsibility for organizing this. In my capacity as associate dean, I have the, the privilege of 
sort of getting the 10,000 foot view of what goes on in the, in the program. And the, the downside to that is perhaps the fact that I don't get to know students for the most part at, at a um, individual and personal level. But I do get to see what's happening with the current students and what's happening with our alumni. And just the, the tremendous opportunity that we have to play a part in their personal and professional developments. And I think that's, that's why I'm still in this role, uh, in, in the management education role after so many years, because uh, it is truly fulfilling to see the kind of uh, growth and development that's possible when these students really put their mind to it. And uh, I wish them certainly the best. And one, one of the things, I have to do a little commercial here, uh, one of the elements that we have just literally within the last month added to our MBA programs is the opportunity for alumni to come back and take another course or courses. And right now, these guys sitting here are saying, you've got to be kidding me. You know, we just survived the program. Why would we want to come back? <laughs> but the thing is, you know, eventually you'll say, hmm, I didn't get that course or something in my workplace, you know, I could have really used that finance course or this marketing course. Uh, so we now have actually opened up electives in our PMBA program, which is you know, running in Des Moines and Cedar Rapids and Davenport, so that any alumni can come back and take an elective course at one half of tuition. Uh, and, and at the PMBA program, that's only $1,000 a course, which uh, is, is a reasonable uh, amount. And there are also, some of you are saying, well, I'm not going to be in eastern Iowa. We also have some online courses. Uh, so don't think that uh, courses are not available to you. So that's um, something we we're doing for our alumni. We hope that helps to keep us connected and helps also to um, extend further development in your careers. Will the graduates please rise? Audience, please join me in congratulating the MBA class of 2016. Thank you. Graduates, you may be seated. Again, I would like to offer my heartfelt congratulations to the graduating MBA class of 2016, and I would like to welcome you to the ranks of Iowa MBA alumni. From Iowa, throughout North America, to Asia and across continental Europe, Africa, and Latin America, our alumni are making a difference in the world of business and society at large. As you go forward along paths followed by so many Tippy alumni, remember what you have learned and experienced here at Tippy, and use your knowledge with integrity. Samuel Johnson, the 18th century English poet, essayist, and moralist said, integrity without knowledge is weak and useless and knowledge without integrity is dangerous and dreadful. So in all you do, please maintain your personal and professional integrity and make us and yourselves proud in that humble Iowa way. Despite the uncertainty that surrounds us in this time of economic, political, and technological challenges, many exciting opportunities are open to you. I have no doubt that all of you will achieve great success in your chosen careers. Remember that wherever you choose to go, the resources of the Tippy College will be at your disposal and the Tippy family will be behind you. Would also ask that you keep your email contact information up to date so we can maintain that connection. We are indeed very proud to add you to the Tippy alumni family. And again, congratulations. 
I would like to once again ask our speaker, Fred Crawford, and thank him for his inspiring comments. Fred, would you please join me at the podium? I'd like to accept this on behalf of our entire audience today. Thank you. On behalf of everyone gathered here today, please accept this token. And again, we express our appreciation for an inspiring talk. And uh, I, I told him before, and I'll say it again, the Aflac commercials are some of my absolute favorites. <laughs> As we leave today, I'll ask that the audience please remain seated while our graduates exit. And if you have made reservations for the brunch, that is in the Coral Ballroom, which is down the hall to the left as you exit the conference center. We want to thank everyone for attending this ceremony today and trust you will enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you.